<clears throat> we left off the other day. Um, On uh, Act 4, Scene 3, page 1303. <clears throat> Bottom of the page, lines 20 and following. <clears throat> King asks Hamlet, where's Polonius? Hamlet tells him at supper. King says at supper where? Not where he eats, but where it is eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are even at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. <coughs> Excuse me. Your worm is your, own, your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. Your fat king and your lean beggar is but variable servants. Two dishes, but to one table. That's the end. And the convocation put a convocation of politic worms. I mentioned the other day <clears throat> that that's probably a reference to the Diet of Worms that occurred in 1521. This is again dealing with Martin Luther who on 1031 1517 505 years ago today nailed the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. All right. So let's spend a couple of minutes just on these four or five lines. He says, Hamlet says, that Polonius is now <clears throat> being eaten by a convocation of politic worms. And you've got a gloss down there, just as an allusion to the deity of worms, politic crafty worms are even at him. Okay. We saw earlier when Hamlet first talks with Polonius, he mentions carrion, the sun, the sun kissing carrion, how it produces maggots, etc., etc. And what Hamlet's doing is he's connecting, what Shakespeare's doing, is he's connecting this little speech and this scene with what Hamlet says there back in, I believe it is act two, okay? So he goes on. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. He's essentially saying worms and emperors, they're the same things, okay? They're both meant for eating. Okay. So how do we eat worms? I don't know about you. I don't eat worms. Okay. Well, what does eat worms? Birds. Birds. What else? If you put them on a hook, fish. Fish. You eat the fish. So you eat the worm. Okay. If you if a bird catches a worm, the bird eats the worm. You kill the bird and eat the bird, you eat the fish. We fat all creatures else to fat us, right? You don't eat a thin, starving cow. You fatten that cow or that steer up. You don't eat a thin, starving pig. You fatten the pig up. We fat all creatures for what? To fatten ourselves. And we fat ourselves for... What's Hamlet's point? Four maggots. What does Hamlet say is the end, let's say, of life. End meaning what happens once we're dead. Not end meaning purpose. Not, not yet, not necessarily. We die, we rot, we get eaten by worms. That's it, okay? Look at what he keeps going on. We fat ourselves for maggots. 
Your fat king <clears throat> and your lean beggar is but variable service. All he means by that is <coughs> they're like two different dishes at the table. You know, Thanksgiving com is coming up in a few weeks. It's like turkey and uh, dressing. The king's turkey or the king is dressing and the beggar is the other, all right? Two dishes, but to one table. What's the table? Death. Kings and beggars, they both end up the same place. And that's why we have to one table, colon, that's the end. He's saying the end is the one table. Yes. Thirteen oh three. Sorry. Okay. King. Alas, alas. Why does Claudius say alas, alas? Because Hamlet's just equated him, the king, with a beggar, and he says, "You, O great and mighty king, and you, O dirty, low scum, sucking, you know, beggar, you both end up in the exact same place." We both end up dead, and we both end up ultimately being eaten by maggots. Right? Hamlet. A man may fish. Okay, notice Hamlet isn't done. He's just, he's going to roll with this. A man may fish with the worm that hath eat of a king, and eat to the fish that hath fed of that worm. So he's not talking about like an earthworm. Take that bet. He might be. He could also be talking of like a maggot. A man can fish with a worm that has eaten through the body of a dead king. And the fish that he catches with that worm, he might eat. He's going to go one step farther. What do you mean by this? Nothing but to show you how a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar. If you eat the fish that ate the worm that ate the king, then you're eating the king. And where is the king going through? And when he uses the language, may go a progress. That was a technical term in Shakespeare's day. If the king went on a progress or the queen, it means the king or queen went on a trip through his or her dominion, visiting certain areas, okay? Okay. Queen Elizabeth found out that she was the queen back in 1953, I think it was 53, when she and Prince Philip were on a trip to the Commonwealth nations. They were on a progress of sorts. Okay? She knew she was next in line. She knew her father was a little bit ill, and he goes and dies. And she's named queen, I think she was in South Africa or something. Um, at the time when she's off visiting. So the king may go th a progress through the guts of a beggar. King in the middle of someone's intestines. It's kind of a foul image if you think about it, especially how that image would naturally, by the progress of digestion, end. Where's Polonius? See, the king now understands where Hamlet's going. Hamlet's saying, King, you're a piece of in heaven. Polonius is in heaven. Send thither to sea. Send someone to heaven to find him. If your messenger, if your messenger find him not there, seek him in the other place yourself. What's the other place? Hell. Hell. Notice. Hamlet here doesn't allow for a third possibility. The rest of the play, the earlier part of the play, you know, it was implied there's heaven, there's purgatory, because the ghost implies that the ghost is in purgatory, and there's hell. Hamlet doesn't say, if he's not in heaven, look in purgatory, maybe he's there. He's kind of saying, Polonius, he either made it or he didn't. No in-between state. But his real point is, go to hell. 
and look for him there. But if indeed you find him not within this month, you shall nose him up as you go up the stairs into the lobby. In other words, go to the lobby and notice. <coughs> Sorry, I woke up with a bad cold. Where was Hamlet walking when he gave us to be or not to be speech? In the lobby. So he's saying, go up the stairway to the lobby. And it's almost like, I'm not saying that Shakespeare is intending this at all. This is the way I kind of read it. It's almost like Hamlet is saying, and you'll find him in the entrance to the place where you guys fight on me. Go, king orders some attendants. Hamlet, I'll wait till you come back. So the king tells Hamlet, He's sending him where and for what reason? Does he say, I'm sending you to England so that you can be killed? No. He says, it's for your own safety. There's a lot of, lot of you know, hullabaloo going on around, you know, your actions, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Hamlet, for England, yay, you know. Good. So is it, if found new star purposes... Hamlet, I see a cherub that sees them. Line 46. Probably just going to say, cherub, okay, cherubim are angels of knowledge. So Hamlet's kind of saying that little, I see one that tells me, a little bird has told me what your purposes are. See, I don't think the king means it's good, or you would say it's good if you knew our purposes, because his purposes are to kill Hamlet. I think what the king is implying by that is your good is my only intention, Hamlet. Hamlet, I see a cherub that sees them. That is, I see your real purposes. But come for England. Farewell, dear mother. Okay. Thy loving father, Hamlet. Is his mother there? Go back for a second. His mother isn't there. So when, when Hamlet says, farewell, good mother, the king goes, um, I'm not your mother, father here. <whistles> Pay attention, Hamlet. Hamlet, my mother. Mother and father is man and wife. Man and wife is one flesh. Go back to Genesis. And so my mother. Come, England. So everybody leaves but the king. King tells us the full plot. We get scene four. Hamlet is on his way to Denmark, all right? And we see Fortin, excuse me, to England. We see Fortinbra, the nephew of the king of Norway, the son of the dead king of previous king of Norway, okay, killed by Hamlet Sr. The dead king of Norway was killed by Hamlet Sr. And Fortinbras says, go, Captain, from me, greet the Danish king, tell him that by his license, Fortinbras craves the conveyance of a promised march over his kingdom. Fortinbras is sending a messenger to Claudius to say, I seek safe passage over a little bit of your territory. Why? He wants to fight for a plot of land that's not in Danish territory, but he has to cross over Danish territory to get there. Captain says, I'll do it. Okay. So, you have Fortinbra, you know, if here's the stage, you got Fortinbra and his troops over here, probably not a few, not many, and then Hamlet, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern enter through the other door and they kind of see them. Uh, excuse me, Fortinbras and the others go off except for the captain. Hamlet comes in, he sees the captain, he says, who are you guys? What are you doing here? Okay. Hamlet asks, how does it go against the army of Poland? That is, how's your battle going? King, the captain says, line 17, we go to gain a little patch of ground. 
that hath in it no profit but the name. That is, there's no reason. There's no military reason. No financial reason. No economic reason to fight for this little plot of ground. The only reason it's worth something is because of its name. Like part of Poland. That's it. Okay? To pay five ducats five, I would not farm it. Nor will it yield to Norway or the Pole a ranker, a ranker rate should it be sold in fee. Hamlet. Why then the Polak will never defend it. If it's not worth anything, then the Poles aren't going to mass a force to defend this little bit of property. Captain, it's already garrisoned. That is, the Poles already have a full garrison to defend this property. Hamlet, 2,000 souls and 20,000 ducats will not debate the question of this straw. Your gloss, settle this trifling matter. So, 2,000 souls. He doesn't say 2,000 men. Why? Because Hamlet's suggesting the men will die. <clears throat> 2,000 souls and 20,000, to use our terminology, dollars, wouldn't settle this trifling matter. You couldn't offer 2,000 men or 20,000 grand or 20 grand to buy this piece of property. Why? Because Hamlet says, this is the imposthume of much wealth and peace. It's the purulent abscess or swelling. That's the posthume, okay? It's the imposthume, the swelling of wealth and peace. Wealth, economy zipping right along. They're doing great. In peace, he's implying too long peace. Hamlet is suggesting, what do kings start to do when they've had too much peace time? They create issues. Why? To prove themselves. To show their honor. So, he goes on. That inward breaks and shows no cause without why the man dies. Captain says, God be with you, sir. Okay. Rosencrantz, can we get going? Hamlet, in a bit. He goes, you two go on. They leave. Hamlet gets a soliloquy. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. All occasions. Every situation, Hamlet says, spurs me like a spur of the flank of a horse. It urges me to revenge. What is a man if his chief good and market of his time, that is, use of his time, be but to sleep and feed. What is a man if his chief good, that is, the best thing for him, what Plato called, translated into Latin, the summum bonum, the highest good, okay, which was God, according to Socrates. All right? If his highest good, and how do you put it? In use of his time is but to sleep and feed. What's Hamlet suggesting about people? If this is their if this is their reason for being, if the highest good, the chief good, is but eating and sleeping, then man, humanity, is what? And we're animals. That's it. That's all we are. Okay? A beast. No more. Sure, he that made us with such large discourse, okay, God, made us with large discourse. Discourse there doesn't only mean the ability to talk. It means with a lot of different faculties, abilities. Looking before and after gave us not that capability and godlike reason to
to fust in us unused. Fust, to grow moldy. God gave us the ability to look before what happened before we came into the world, to consider that, and to consider what comes after, you know, the undiscovered front country from whose born no one returns, death and such. He didn't give us that ability and God-like reason to do what? To grow moldy. God wants us to, Hamlet is saying, think about our existence. Remember when we were talking about Sophocles? And I mentioned the Oracle of Delphi, and the, I think I mentioned it, and the Oracle of Delphi had inscribed on a stone, Know thyself. Socrates, Socrates, the philosopher, not Sophocles, the author, Socrates, the author, was told by the oracle, you're the wisest man in the world. And so he went on a program of walking around and asking people questions because he wanted to prove to himself and to the oracle that the oracle was wrong. I'm not the wisest man in the world. And what Socrates, the reason Socrates was the wisest man in the world was because Socrates said, I don't know anything. That humility showed he was the wisest because everybody he talked to, they all got on their little soapboxes and acted all high and mighty, like they had all the answers. And so what he did was he just started questions, questioning them, pulling apart their houses of cards that they had created for themselves. So Hamlet is saying, we're supposed to think about why we are here. That's the what comes before, what comes after, well, what's in the middle? Why are we here now? What is our purpose? Now, whether it be bestial oblivion or some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event, a thought which quartered hath but one part wisdom and ever three parts coward, I do not know why yet I live to say this thing is to do. His point is, I don't know why I haven't done it yet. It's still on his bucket list. It's still on his to-do list. Since, that's what Sith means, I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. I have cause. The ghost has spurred him to revenge. He knows Claudius is guilty because he saw how Claudius reacted to the play. He has will, the desire, the volition to do it. He has strength. And he has the ability, the means. So he goes on and says, examples gross as earth exhort me. There's all kinds of examples that kind of spur him onwards. He says, look at this right ahead of me. There's this army of mass in charge led by a delicate and tender prince, Fortinbras, Prince of Norway, whose spirit with divine ambition puff makes mouths at the invisible event, exposing what is mortal and ensure to all that fortune, death and danger dare even for an eggshell. This guy, Fortinbras, is willing to risk it all for what? An eggshell. Not a literal eggshell, this little bit of land which from what the captain told him is worth an eggshell. That's very you know. So, rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument. Okay? Rightly to be great, he says, is not to stir without great argument. That is great reason. Great purpose. It isn't great to get involved in a fight, an argument, a war over something that's not monumental. Okay? But greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honor is at the stake. If honor is involved, 
Then Hamlet says, what can trigger war? The smallest little offense. If one's honor is being challenged, then a look <laughs> is enough to go to war or go to battle for it. So what is he suggesting about Fortinbras? He's willing to lose it all. Why? Because his honor has been challenged because the Poles have not given up this bit of land. That's it. Because it's not, therefore, just the honor of Fortinbras, is it? Fortinbras is a representative of Norway, the king. It's the king. It's Norway whose honor is now involved. By the way, major theme in Shakespeare's plays, this idea of honor. Okay? The Henry IV plays are largely about this notion of honor or excess honor. Okay? So he says, he's willing to risk all these men's lives for the piece of land because of honor. And here, how do I stand? A father killed, a mother stained, excitements of my reason and blood, and let all sleep. That is, and I haven't done anything yet. While to my shame I see the imminent death of 20,000 men. For what? For a fantasy and a trick of fame. 61. Toy, trifle of fame. Go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot whereon the numbers cannot try their means prove or justify. Where the numbers cannot try or justify the cause, which is not too mean of incontinent to hide the slain. That bit of property isn't even large enough, Hamlet is telling us, to bury those men. From this time forth, be my thoughts. Excuse me, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth. That is, he's coming back to kill Claudius. That's all I'm going to think about, okay? Scene five. Enter Horatio, the queen, a gentleman. Okay? And they talk about Ophelia. Ophelia seems a little off. And then we see Ophelia come in. And she asks, where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? And she and the queen talk back and forth. And Ophelia sings. And the queen asks, what, what is the song about? What do you mean by this song? Okay. And the king comes in. He asks Ophelia how she is. She says, well, God yield you, God shield you, God protect you, okay? She says, they say the owl was a baker's daughter. Reference to a monkish legend that a baker's daughter was turned into an owl for refusing bread to the Savior. They say the owl was a baker's daughter. Lord. Now, is she, saying, is she saying, Lord, to the king? Or is she saying, Lord, to God? We know what we are, but know not what we may be. Why do we know not what we may be? Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. Okay? By the way, that's a paraphrase of I always forget. I never write it down in my book. It's a paraphrase of something um, of St. Paul. Where Paul's saying, we know what we are now, but we know not what we may become. That is, um, in heaven, what we will be like. Okay? So, she goes on singing and leaves. Everybody else leaves. And notice 
She makes it clear just before she leaves. This is because of her father and her father's death. She says, I cannot choose but weep to think that they would lay him in the cold ground. My brother shall know of it. So she's going to send word to Laertes that Polonius has been killed. King says, follow her, make sure she doesn't do anything rash, etc., etc. Um, he talks to Gertrude. He says this is because of Ophelia, uh, Polonius' death. Messengers come in. Da, 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 da. The people outside Elsinore, that is the people of the town, are all crying, Laertes, Laertes shall be king. We want Laertes, etc., etc. Okay. And Laertes comes in. Why are the people saying we want Laertes to be king? There is a king already. It's like the people are suggesting we don't trust Claudius anymore. Okay. So Laertes comes in and Gertrude tells him to calm down. Line 114. Laertes says that drop of blood that's calm proclaims me bastard. The drop of blood in me that is calm regarding my father's death, he says, would make me a bastard to my father. Illegitimate son. He says, no, all of my blood is on fire. Why? Because he needs to avenge his father's death. There's such divinity doth hedge a, um, excuse me, the king speaks and he says, what is the cause, Laertes, that thy rebellion looks so giant-like, that it has grown so large? What, what is your cause for rebelling against me? Let him go, Gertrude, because Gertrude's kind of holding on to him. Do not fear our person, okay? He won't touch me. Why? Because the king says, there's such divinity doth hedge a king that treason can but peep to what it would acts little of his will. And the king is getting there at the notion it's from the Middle Ages of the divine right of kings based on Paul's letter to the Romans. Okay? Romans chapter 12, I believe it is that talks about all government is instituted by God for the protection of people under the government. All right? There's divinity that hedges a king. He doesn't mean necessarily that God is putting his hands around Claudius. He's saying, I have a mark of divinity about me. All right? Because of my kingship. Dead keeps others from harming me. See, prior, up until this day in English history, no king or queen had ever been publicly executed by parliament, for example. Kings had been deposed and, oops, accidentally died while in custody. Okay? Less than 50 years after this play, an English king, Charles I, will be publicly tried, executed, beheaded by Parliament. So, he says, Laertes, why are you so angry? Where's my father? Dead. And the queen says, but not by him. Claudius didn't do this. Let him finish. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with to hell and legions vows to the blackest devil. His point is, who killed him? Because I want to kill that person. Okay. So they talk back and forth, and I'm going to skip a bunch. And Ophelia comes in. Larity sees her. She's kind of sing-songy again. And Ophelia leaves. Middle of, uh, bottom of 1311. Do you see this, O oh God? He doesn't ask the king if he sees it. He's, okay, God, 
You've got to fix this. So, Laertes says, I must commune with your grief, or you deny me right. Go to the part. Make choice of whom your wisest friends you will, and they shall hear and judge to you and me. If by direct or by collateral hand they find us touched, we will our kingdom give. Go, find some friends, come back to me, we will talk, and if they determine that I have any part in Polonius' death, I will give you half of my kingdom. Fair deal. Okay. Scene six. Another room in the castle. So, by the way, the way you get scene divisions is when the stage is empty for a moment. Everybody is exited. When somebody else comes back on, new scene begins. All right? So, a gentleman comes in bearing letters from Hamlet. Horatio reads the letter. Okay? And he says in the letter, when thou shalt have overlooked, this is line 11, page 13, 12, when thou shalt have overlooked, lost my point, this, give these fellows some means to the king. In other words, give them passage to the king. Let them carry something. They have letters for him. Talks about a storm that came on. They were, uh, excuse me, how a pirate <coughs> ship came on. They boarded them, et cetera, et cetera. Hamlet became the prisoner of the pirate. They've dealt me with me like thieves of mercy. Um, he says, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern hold their course for England. Of them I have much to tell thee. He doesn't tell us here what he did to, for lack of a better word, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. That's going to come up later. Okay? Scene 7. So, the king and Laertes talk, and the king tells Laertes, it was Hamlet who did your father in, um, and he says, I will help you get your revenge. All right? Messenger comes in, bearing the letters from Hamlet, and the king reads, line 45, 40, line 43. Right. So the messengers leave, and it's only the king of Laertes. He says, Laertes, you need to read, you need to hear this too. High and mighty. He's describing the king here, Hamlet is. High and mighty. You shall know I am set naked on your kingdom. Now your gloss tells you, set naked on your kingdom, unprovided with retinue. I'm alone. It also means, I think, weaponless. That is, I come without weapons. Okay. Tomorrow shall I beg leave to see your kingly eyes, when I shall, first asking your pardon thereunto, recount the occasion of my sudden and more strange return. Right? Because he's supposed to be going to England, Hamlet was told, receiving the tribute from England and then coming back. That would take... A few days, but he's seemingly gone and back within 24, maybe 48 hours. Laertes, do you know the hand, handwriting? Yeah, it's Hamlet's all right. Okay, so the king says, can you devise me? That is, what advice do you give to me? Laertes, oh, I don't know. Let him come. It warms the very sickness in my heart that I shall live and tell him to his teeth, thus did thou. Because that's what he means. You killed my father. Thus, he's giving him recompense or revenge. Okay? So, the king says, will you be ruled by me? And what he means by that is, will you be overruled? Will you take my advice? Laertes, as long as you don't overrule me to a peace, as long as you don't advise me to make peace with Hamlet. He goes, no, 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 don't worry about, don't worry about that. So he says, I will work him to an exploit, now ripen my device, that is in my thinking, 
under the which he shall not choose but fall, and for his death no wind of blame shall breathe. So, I've got an idea, and there's no way Hamlet lives in this idea, but also, neither you nor I will receive any blame for his death. It will look entirely like an accident. Laertes, okay, I'll do that. Okay. So, uh, talks about the poison. He talks about the king. Talks bottom of thirteen fifteen ninety two and following. Talks about the word he has received about what a great fencer, okay, swordsman, Laertes is, okay, and. He asks Laertes, page 13, 16, 122 and following, what would you undertake to show yourself your father's son indeed more than in words? How would you prove your father's, you are your father's son? Laertes, to cut his throat in the church. I would even kill Hamlet in a church. Major, you know, um, What's the word I want? Violation uh, starts with S. Can't think of the word. Cut his throat in the church. King, no place indeed should murder sanctuary. His revenge should have no bounds. So, like, he tells Laertes, keep all this secret. He says, and here what we'll, here's what we'll do. We'll arrange a fencing match. Your foil, that's what his sword is called, your foil will have poison on the tip. Okay? A sword unbeaten. That is, when, when you have a fencing match, the tip of the foil, and the, the foil is, is a rod, but it's shaped like a square. Right? So where the foil meets the handle, that usually something like this, okay? Handle comes back, or hilt comes back this way, and then the foil comes out, but it's square until you get to the point like that. That point would have like a plastic or rubber tip on it, so that when you strike your opponent, you don't puncture. See, the purpose of a fencing match is not to kill the other individual. You can't strike with the flat of the foil. That doesn't count. It has to be with the point. Okay? And the foils are very flexible. You can hit somebody with the foil and the foil will bend. Pretty substantial. Okay? He says, so, we'll do that. In lyric, he says, I will put poison on the tip so that with it unbaited, with the protection of, I will wound Hamlet, and the poison will therefore kill him. King says, yeah, okay, that's good, but we'll take this one step further. I've got poison also, and I will put it in a drink for Hamlet. And we'll call for a timeout, and I'll give Hamlet the drink, so he'll drink poison. Okay. Queen comes in. One woe that tread upon another's heel, so fast they follow. Your sister's drowned, Laertes. No, notice, no sugar coating, no, you know, letting him sit down, no beating around the bush. Just your sister's dead. Drowned. Drowned where? And she tells us. Okay. Question is. How did she drown? Accident or suicide? Okay. We're told, 170 and following, she, there on the pendant brows, 
boughs, her crown of weeds clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke, when down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. She climbed out, according to Gertrude, on a branch to reach for some flowers. The branch fell into the stream and Ophelia drowned because she was entirely dressed and the clothing was heavy once it soaked with water. There's a famous painting by um, my daughter's favorite artist, can't remember his name, of Ophelia lying there. Her hair is all spread out behind her. Her gown is all spread out like flat and she's just floating there as she slowly sinks. So, Laertes in a sense, in Laertes' mind, he now has two deaths to avenge. Because in his opinion, Ophelia died because of her madness caused by the death of Polonius. Okay? Act five. Churchyard. Two clowns. They're not really clowns. They're grave diggers. Notice your gloss. The word clown was used to denote peasants as well as humorous characters. Here applied to the rustic type of clown. Okay? They're grave diggers. So the first one says to the second one, is she to be buried in Christian burial when she willfully seeks her own salvation? What is the first clown, first grave digger, saying to the second one? With the comment about willfully seeking her own salvation. She committed suicide. That's what he means. I tell thee she is. Therefore, make her grave straight. Okay? Straight away, immediately. Some interpret from east to west in a direct line parallel with the church. Why? Churches were physically arranged so that the altar, or apse, the area where the altar is, faced east for the rising of the sun. Right? Whole image of resurrection, rising of the sun. And so that her grave should also be east-west. Okay? The crowner, that is the coroner, has set on her and finds it Christian burial. Every death in England required a coroner's inquest, a coroner's hearing, to determine the cause of death. All right? In Christian tradition, up through at least this period, in both the Anglican, at this time, the Anglican Church, and in the Catholic Church, if someone committed suicide, they were not allowed Christian burial. Because suicide was essentially, uh, it's kind of akin to what Christ calls the blasphemy against the spirit. The one unforgivable sin. Why? How so? Every other sin you can repent. You can't repent for suicide. You can't say, God forgive me, I'm going to kill myself. Because you can't be repentant for something you haven't done. You can only be repentant for something you've already done. Okay? And the act of suicide is essentially telling God, my problem is too big for you to resolve. Okay? So, the coroner has said, this was an accidental death, therefore she gets Christian burial. First clown, how can that be? unless she drowned herself in her own defense. He's introducing kind of the notion of madness as self-defense. How can, how can she get Christian burial unless she drowned herself in her own defense? That is, unless she was defending herself against something. Tis found so. That is, I don't know. It's what the coroner said. Must be say offendendo. And what the clown means is say defendendo. Term used in verdicts of justifiable homicide. It was self-defense. 
defendendo, not offended, because offendendo is self-offense. She offended herself, okay? It cannot be else, for here lies the point. If I drown, drown myself wittingly, that is knowingly, it argues an act. And an act has three branches. This is Aristotelian philosophy, Aristotelian and Platonic philosophy. Acts have certain portions that they can be broken up into. It is, that is the three branches of an action, are to act, to do, and to perform. Argal, she drowned herself wittingly. He says, no, stop. First line goes on. Here lies the water. Okay, good. Here's the man. Okay, good. If the man go to the water and drown himself, that is willy-nilly. He goes, mark you that. That is, he does it himself. But if the water come to him and drown him, he doesn't drown himself. So if the guy walks into the ocean or into the stream and drowns, he's done that himself. Second clown. Yeah, but is this law? That is, is what you're saying, is it that what the actual law says? He says it is. It's coroner's, coroner's inquest law. Okay? He says, you want to know the truth of it? The second clown says. You want to know the real truth? If she hadn't been a gentlewoman, she should have been buried out of the Christian burial. What's he mean by gentlewoman? We don't use the word gentlewoman anymore. What do we use? If she hadn't been politically connected. If she hadn't been high status, high class. Not high class, a lot of money. That's why I use the phrase politically connected. If she hadn't been among the rich and powerful, she'd have been where, buried where? Just in a ditch somewhere. But no. She's what? Daughter of the advisor to the king. Love interest of Hamlet. Okay. First clown. You're right. There thou sayst it. And the more pity that great folks should have countenance in this world to drown or hang themselves. That is, and it's more pity, that is, it's more pitiful that great people should have the privilege to Privilege, by law, okay, kind of what that means, to drown or hang themselves more than their even ordinary, everyday Christians. Okay? There is no ancient gentleman but gardeners, ditchers, and grave makers. Why? They hold up Adam's profession. What was Adam's profession? Tend the garden, till the garden, and keep it. He's saying... Gardeners, ditchers, and grave makers were all like Adams. Okay? Was he a gentleman? First that ever bore arms. That is, these kinds of arms. To be a gentleman in Shakespeare's day meant you had to have a coat of arms. Before his death, Shakespeare purchased a coat of arms for his father. That is, had one actually drawn up. You had to go to the, can't remember what it's called. It's a heraldic, heraldic, heraldic institution where they devise your coat of arms based on your ancestry. Okay? And because Shakespeare had ris risen in society so much, he was now able to do that in the late 1590s, early 1600s. I'm pretty sure it was bef just before Hamlet was written. Okay? So, second clown says, he had none. That is, he had no coat of arms. The first clown's talking about Adam was the first man with arms, okay? What, art a heathen? How dost thou understand the scripture? The scripture says Adam did. How do you dig it up? So, they keep talking and joking back and forth. Hamlet and Horatio come in from a distance. So the clowns are now out here digging. Hamlet and Horatio come in here. Okay. And the second clown leaves. The first clown's digging. And Hamlet says, Has this fellow no feeling of his business? That he sings at grave making? 
That is, how does he make light of the fact that someone has just died? Now, Hamlet doesn't know whose grave he is digging. Horatio, custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. That is, he's been doing this so long that he's no longer what? He's no longer struck by death. It no longer means much to him. He's seen too much of it. Okay? Hamlet, tis even so. And the first clown keeps singing, and he throws up a skull. Why? Shakespeare's implying that in Denmark, they're reusing graves because they reuse graves in England. Got a number of people, you've got only so big a plot of land, churchyard small. You find a grave that looks pretty old, you just dig down. If there's bones there, you put them up, bury the new body, put the old bones on top. Okay? Hamlet, 1320. We will stop there. <clears throat> We will, we'll definitely finish uh, Hamlet this week. So don't forget the quiz due Wednesday night.